before I assemble the set, I'm going to take the wooden parts and lightly sand them with some 600 grit sandpaper and then give them a clear coat. So while I'm doing this, I have something to show you. In part one, we saw that Vic had included some high quality dial scales for two different Carl D. Beer crystal radio sets. If you've never seen one, Carl himself built this one about 30 years ago. Now, Carl's dial scale is just a piece of paper that was colored in with a marker, whereas Vic's seems to be printed with a color laser jet. Now, this radio works very well. It's a very simple circuit, and like the Peeble set, you can vary the coupling between the coils to increase or decrease the selectivity. So I expect the Peeble set to work similar to this one, but with the added feature that it can pick up short wave. All of our wooden parts are sanded and ready for the clear coat. I'm going to give it a coat of this Krylon Fusion all-in-one flat clear. I don't know what they mean by all-in-one, it's just clear. But I went to Walmart to buy this and it was $10, so I left. And I went to Ace Hardware. When I got to Ace Hardware, all of the spray paint at Ace Hardware is $10 a can. Now last year it was $5 a can. So the government's telling us that the rate of inflation is 9%. But the cost of the can of spray paint is going up 200%. Well, I've been shaking this can for two minutes. So let's see how our $10 can of clear coat actually performs. What the, what the dickens? Didn't it say clear on the can? It's like it's just a picture. It's a picture of the base. See, it's got scotch tape on the back. All right, we'll let that dry and we'll turn them over and put another coat on. I got some pictures in my email yesterday and I thought to myself, this looks like the Mike Peoples Crystal Radio Kit, which in fact it turned out to be. This is the kit that Vic had purchased on eBay. Now what's interesting about this kit is the age of it. Mike Peoples had stopped using plywood years ago because he had problems with it splintering. This kit's probably from the 1990s. This is the same kit, but the panel, the base, and the two coil forms are turned over. These are the two coil forms that came with the kit. You can see on the bottom there's a little bit of splintering going on. On the top coil form are some pencil marks still seen where Mike had traced the outline of the coil form before he cut it, apparently by hand. None of the gaps between the veins are consistent. I think Mike would be very pleased to see how it's done today. This is a computer controlled milling machine making one of his coil forms. Okay, let's get started. Let's begin. What? Let's begin. What's wrong with let's get started? It sounds so stupid. Yeah, but that's what the chatbot says at the phone company when you call. Huh. You want to work at the phone company? Not again. I really like the look of this black faceplate. But since it's a clone of the people's kit, I'm going to use the white one that Vic included. I'll glue it on with this E6000. This is a uh, archival glue. You can use it to repair books or papers and it won't discolor the paper. The back of it's pretty shiny so to get the glue to stick we're going to rough it up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I, I told you if you didn't pay me the money I was going to rough you up, didn't I?
I'm going to put some weight on it while it's drying and um, I'm going to use these Radio Boys books. These books are 100 years old this year. I like the series by Alan Chapman, though I think that's a pen name. I don't care so much for the Gerald Breckenridge versions, but this one's cool because it says, presented to Frederick Grover by his teacher, Claire S. Mason, for good lessons and good conduct in school, June 1925. That should do it. All right, now it's time to do the coil. According to the directions, we wind the coil clockwise, shiny side towards us. Well, both sides are shiny, so I'll put a little mark on the coils which represent the shiny side. So we mount the spool of wire that Vic supplied and you put it through the little hole in the clothespin. Get in there. You pull it out through the top and that keeps tension on the wire. That's a a little tip from Elmer Osterhout of MRL. Let me clamp this to the table. Oh, come on. Hello. This is an idea from Elmer Osterhout. And then we clamp the jig to the table. So I guess you put a knot in it. Wait, if it's going to go clockwise. Hmm. All right. Loop the wire twice onto itself. I guess that means tie a knot. I'm all thumbs here. That looks okay. All right, so we're going to go clockwise. He says to keep the windings tight. This is not as easy it would as you would think. Hmm. Okay, there's one. One turn. I don't like the way that looks. Hmm. Start over. I don't know how tight is tight. He said tight, so.
I've seen some better looking coils, but this was good practice for the larger one. The larger one has 75 turns and two taps on it. And I guess I uh, figured out how to count the turns. I don't know why going all the way around is considered one turn. But when you count them, you count both sides. Now, to me, this is 10. I'm starting to suspect I messed this up. I've got too much wire left on the spool and this coil looks too small. Uh, I could keep going, but my taps are in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. Here are the completed coils. I'm a little disappointed in the uh, appearance of them. I wanted them to look like they were made on a machine or that they came from RCA or Philco. Uh, they always look a little ragged between the windings and I've made them several times and they always look like that. I don't know if it's the my technique or the or the wire. So here we have our taps here at uh, 15, 32. This one is 75, the last turn and uh, this wire here is zero. So the coils are complete and uh, hopefully that was the hard part and we can start assembling the set.